This Week in Startups is brought to you by LinkedIn. A business is only as strong as its people and every hire matters. Go to linkedin.com slash twist and get a $50 credit towards your first job post. Segment. Segment's startup program has exclusive deals with the best tools and resources to become a data expert. To see if you qualify for a free account worth up to $25,000, go to segment.com slash twist. And Rippling, the world's first way for businesses to manage their HR and IT in one system. If you're looking for an easier way to onboard and supercharge new employees, go to rippling.com slash twist and get 20% off. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Startups. I'm Jason Calacanis, your host. I'm here in my hometown of New York, and I'm really thrilled to have our next guest. In 2014, three founders in San Mateo started a little website called YouTube. And I said, this website is going to be uh, the home of pirated content, and it's a total fraud. And it was going to be shut down. And the, the founder, Chad Hurley, said to me, Jason, you don't get it. It's not about the stolen content. We're going to solve that problem. It's about the creatives, a new generation of creatives that will come out of this ecosystem where people no longer have to pay to put their videos on the web, and they can syndicate them. In the short term, I was right. In the long term, he was right, as often is the case. The company was sold for $1.6 billion, the worst sale by founders ever in the history of Silicon Valley. It's a $250 to $500 billion company today, uh, but at the time they couldn't get over the copyright issues. But in the long term, they did figure out the copyright issues thanks to Google and some clever technology. And out of that project came a generation of vloggers and new creatives. The leader of that group, Casey Neistat, I got it? All right, we're done everybody. I pronounced his name correctly. Uh, Casey Neistat started vlogging on that platform, and he is now uh, the standard bearer for YouTube creatives. He has over 10 million subscribers on the platform and now has a big open space in my hometown of New York City on Broadway where his super fans wait outside for him to take pictures. I first became aware of him because I saw him snowboarding in a video on YouTube in Manhattan. Welcome to This Week in Startups, Casey. Um, happy to be here. Although, this is my office. I know. You are happy to be in your office? Yeah, so... It's, Can it's, I take my glasses off? Yeah, you look ridiculous. I do look ridiculous. Look, I look like a cop. Casey, do you know why I'm pulling you over? You seriously look like you have a real cop. Um, I was going to be in the FBI. That was actually my dream. <laughs> Jason, I know this is your podcast, and I know we're about 40 seconds in, but do you mind if I just issue one, two, three, four, five corrections to, to your opening monologue? For sure. Okay. Oh, I said 2014? You it's said 2004. 20, you said 2014. Yeah. Uh, no, that's not when, uh, it's not 2004, when YouTube right. launched. Okay. And then you said that that was the worst sale at 1.1 billion 1.6 billion 1.6 billion yeah. worst sale for the founders best sale for the company sure that but i think there's some nuance there you present that as if it's like an objective empirical statement and i would push back against that go ahead well i think i think instagram's up there instagram would be a close number two do you think instagram will last the test of time in 20 years which has a better chance of being larger and more sustainable youtube or instagram Okay, so my response to that would be to ask you, do you think that the founders of Instagram could have taken it to the level it is now without Facebook? 100. Versus, you think so? 100. I think so too. Do you think that YouTube's founders could have taken it to the place it is now without Google? I don't think so. It was a coin toss. 50-50. So, okay, so yeah. just, just for the validating yeah. my points here. Then... Um, Another thing I want to push back on on my list of corrections for you is that are you not the standard bearer of YouTube I mean, creatives? I I would I would definitely object to that. Um, you would object to that, but literally when I told people I was coming here, my CMO said, "Can I fly down from Toronto?" <laughs> okay, well I appreciate that. No, I because he's a vlogger and literally his entire life is imitating you. CMO Press, right over here. You can see him in the background. His entire life is making, he made a video of himself running 21 miles, walking 21 miles yesterday, and it's literally a Casey video. Well, I know, I appreciate that. It's Casey I, style. I just, um, I feel like, 
the magic of YouTube is that there is no, if there is a baton, it's handed off so quickly. And I do think that I was lucky enough to either hold that baton or be very close to holding that baton yeah. for a minute. And then just like everybody else, it, it, it went on to the next. And that, that, that constant uh, evolution of YouTube and culture and everything is, is part of what is so magical about it. But you stated it with such... Um, so unequivocally well here's um, the thing i mean if we've learned anything in the age of trump is that if you say it and you're confident enough it, it is true. true well i appreciate okay. that no collusion cassie it's okay. like um i i think of it more as like uh, it's you know it's it's like it's ever-changing hands and the whatever yeah. is attracting the most eyeballs in youtube is different today than it was yesterday so i, I don't think that there's ever here's what a, i think is very unique about you and i'd like to get your feedback on it maybe this is just me doing f flattery bait and, it is a little flattery bait, but I'll take it. You're taking the hooks. I'm Let's taking the flattery bait. Let's do it. I always feel like you have authenticity and you do what you do because you truly find it interesting and artistically relevant or rewarding. I, when I watch your videos, as opposed to other YouTubers, they, uh, the other YouTubers seem thirsty and like they're trying to increase their subscriber count. I get the sense that you don't give a fuck. You're doing your art. And I think that's what's very unique because it is very easy on YouTube to fall into the let's do a reaction video or let's do a collab video. I, I don't see you doing that kind of sellout stuff. And even when you do um, something commercial, like you did something at some point where Listerine or Scope, I don't know who it was, um, like gave you a shit ton of money and you took a wave runner to a Alaska. Um, yeah, British Columbia. What who were we thinking? And I just thought, and I'm watching this helicopter, and I'm like, this kid is living his best life. Some ad agency gave you a it helicopter. Go, that did not go down well, by the way. Did it not? No. Wait, who was it? Listerine or Scope? Um, it was Listerine, and it was which a, is, by the way, the best. Scope is terrible. I agree. Buy Listerine. Listerine is and the gentlemen. greatest. No, I don't remember what the brand deal was, and now I'm much less sensitive. You know, like mm. I'm, I'm literally today after when I leave you, I'm going to record a, a promo for NordVPN. It's a great product, but regardless, I love like, NordVPN. Yeah, it's what everybody I use. should have a VPN. So I use the code Casey. Uh, <laughs> I think it's way. I think it's fifty. In any event, um, back then was when my YouTube channel was really starting to pop, and I was really sensitive about brand deals, and I liked the Listerine one, but I, I don't think that. Um, Did your fans react negatively? No, no, not at all. Um, I, it just for me felt more like I, I, I think that um, I was very sensitive to being to YouTube being something that wasn't a pure artistic outlet for me. Wow, that's so quaint and interesting. Like, so this is what I meant by you have. I think you're the standard bearer because of that authenticity. Like, you actually care. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's uh, it's that 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 perspective has mat matured or what do they say in politics when they change their, their feeling about something that has evolved? Evolved. I've evolved. When I first started, you know, like I didn't, I never clicked the monetization button for the first hundred million views on YouTube. Uh, wow. No pre-rolls, no ads. I got no, um, no AdSense money. checks, yeah. no money. And it was because I always figured out how to, I always had ways of monetizing my, um, my work, like the yeah. videos I'd make in other venues and other avenues and other right. ways. Yeah. And YouTube was sort of this sacred thing for me. Hmm. And, uh, you know, before I really started my vlog and really got into the world and the culture of YouTube, um, protecting that, like YouTube was just this little thing for me where I could put my videos and it felt safe. And I didn't pay attention to the community or the culture or the comments or any of the factors except for the fact that here's this pure distribution outlet. Yeah, and yeah. then when I started the vlog, things got so out of control, um, so quickly that it really forced me to reevaluate my understanding of what the platform was for and how it could serve me. What What is I'm interested in that last statement of like what the platform really is for because it does seem like this when YouTube is at its peak or when it's at its peak engagement, it's vlogging, it's somebody looking into the camera and in a very personal way talking about their experience. It, it's almost somewhere between Warhol and reality TV and the Truman Show. What is it about that vlog format that is so compelling in your mind? Um, you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, to be honest, I don't find it that compelling. I don't watch YouTube. But you do um, it all the time. Right? Is it, is, I, would you I, say I, yours is the vlog format? Yo, absolutely. At, yeah. I sit and I look in the camera and I 
fucking pontificate um, like everybody else. Do you watch other people's vlogs? That's you, what I mean. No, I you don't, don't find I, other people vlogging interesting. Eh, it, if I have a choice to sit down and watch Netflix or HBO or Game of Thrones or reruns of The Office or watch YouTube, I'll always pick the prior. I'm an old man. Are I'm you? How old are you? 38 as of two weeks ago. Oh, I'm 48, yeah. But but it, I am um, at the... I'm, so here's an interesting anecdote. Yeah, I am the oldest millennial. Like my wife is a couple years old. I mean, she's definitely not a millennial. Yeah, you're... you're... And, and I have a kid who I had when I was 16. Um, and he's the, he's the youngest millennial. So right now he's 21 and I'm 38. And I, I definitely think we're part of the same generation. But I'm on the oldest end of that. And he's yeah. on the end, youngest end of that. In any event, I say that because like I still have an affinity for not the content that I think my audience has an affinity for, not mm. the content that... This that, Gen Z, this younger generation of millennials. Yeah, but I also think it's, I think it's millennial and Gen Z. I think both of them yeah. both have an affinity for the kind of content that you were describing. And I think you, you started this dialogue out by saying, why, are pe why do people find that interesting? Yes. And I think the answer to that is, we are so, we in society, we're so inundated with content, with media these mm. days. Um, you're 48, I'm 38, when we were both kids. Yeah. I had Nickelodeon. You may not have had Nickelodeon. I remember when cable came out. I did not grow up with Nickelodeon. I, I grew up with ABC and NBC having Saturday morning cartoons. Great. We, so, cartoons were something you got to watch after school or on Saturdays. So Saturday morning was for cartoons. So perfect illustration. So you, you had afternoons and you had Saturdays, and I had afternoons and you know, until my parents would make me turn it off. Right. And I look at people today. I look at me. Yeah. Um, I look around. Uh, I look at, we're in my office right now and yeah. there are five people in here and three of the five in here are, four of the five in here, four of the six in here are staring at screens. Yeah. We spend the vast majority of our time and our days in front of screens. And I think that what that, does in aggregate is it makes you hypersensitive to what it is that you're consuming. Mm. Um, and I think most of this is on the subconscious level, but it does make you, it, it, it makes you very conscious of what you're consuming and what it is. And with that, there's so much bullshit in the world of media, so much marketing and advertising and trying to get you to pay spin. attention to this and spin and algorithms that are putting stuff in front of you that are yeah. meant to you know, give you the right amount of dough that we sort of yearn for a sense of something that's real or true. Yeah. And we have no idea what to trust. And then all of a sudden there's this kid and she's sitting on the edge of her bed talking into yeah. a camera that's not very Lonely well girls, set up. What, and 15, 16, what was her name? Lonely girl. Yeah, I mean, you're, that, was, that was 2006, 2007. But and it turned uh, out that was all a giant all fraud. But no, I'm talking about hoax. now. I'm talking yeah. about those vloggers you were yes. referring to. And I think to a generation that feels somewhat disenfranchised from the media that's shoved down their throat, yeah. they find something refreshing in, in Felix talking to camera every day about whatever it is he's excited about. They yeah. find something exciting about learning about the latest technology from I Justine, who's just sitting in her bedroom recording or Marquez Brownlee because you watched him come up you know right. he's a real person there's no questioning the source of the of the voice and I think that's a really special thing if you need to hire somebody go to LinkedIn that's how I'm finding all my great people Charles, who works with us in the studio and records This Week in Startups, we found him. He had a full-time job, but he was a passive job seeker. What that means is he wasn't out there actively looking, but when he was on LinkedIn getting messages from his friends and updating his profile and reading the news, he saw an ad for the studio director position for This Week in Startups. And he said, that looks interesting. That podcast, I listened to it. Oh, wow, they have an opening? Let me take a look. Let me just browse browse through this opportunity and you know what happened he clicked and he applied and we found somebody who wasn't looking for a job in a low uh unemployment situation like we have in the united states if people are out there looking they're the last two or three percent of people who are trying to find jobs the most experienced people are in high demand and you want to find those passive job seekers and that's what we did we have hired i think three people now uh, our marketing manager at marine uh, up in toronto and we do this through LinkedIn. So hurry over, go to linkedin.com slash twist, T-W-I-S-T, and you will get $50 off your first job post. That's linkedin.com slash twist to get $50 of 50 right now for you at linkedin.com slash twist. Terms and conditions apply. It works. Go use it. I'm telling you, I would not steer you wrong. We use it. We love it. linkedin.com slash twist. 50.
It's also neat. I, I just realized when you were saying that, it reminds me of when I was growing up in the 80s and 90s, when you found out about YouTube and what tour you saw. So did you see them on The Unforgettable, Fire, did you say Joshua Tree, Octung Baby? When did you find out about U2, um, U2, the band? Like, and how early you got on board was kind of like how cool you are. And if you look at YouTube, it's you got to watch people with 100,000 subscribers go to a million to 10 million to PewDiePie is 100 million? Yeah, he's 90s, Insane. yeah, it's, he's really. What do you think of PewDiePie? That's, I find that super weird because he, is is he in Stockholm or Sweden or something? Uh, or? He lives in the UK, but he's from UK. Sweden. He's yeah. from Sweden. And it's just, he's the most popular guy in America playing games. What are your thoughts on him? Um, well, I don't. I think he's the he's he's the most subscribed to YouTuber in the world. So I think right. that's a that's a more sort of empirical description than yeah. maybe most most popular guy in any any region. Right. Um, and he 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 has really moved on from the gaming space. His right. videos now are almost entirely commentary. Right. Um, and I, I think that what he's done on YouTube that's fantastic uh, and 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 unique. Uh, in the most literal term, he's the only person who's been able to do this. Is he has not only maintained his his sort of dominance over the platform, but he's maintained his relevance for the last many, many, many years. That right. idea that I was saying about passing the baton and how cyclical yeah. it is and how quickly turnover is. The anomaly in that is Felix. Right. And look, he he busts his ass. He posts one or two videos a day, every single day. And that's remarkable. Showing up is a big part of YouTube success. Sure. Right? I, I don't I don't show up anymore. Um, I, How often do you post? Now, now I, you know, I try to post a couple times a week and I'm lucky yeah. if I hit that. Do you still love doing it or is it exhausting now? I, I love doing it, but um, for myriad reasons, some some self-inflicted and others more ex external, um, I my focus right now today is yeah. just in a, in a place where it's way more fragmented than it was and yeah. i'm aggressively working towards zeroing that focus so i can do what really makes me happy which is making videos this is part of the challenge of success you get successful at something and then everybody wants to meet you so that you can do something for them and do some project with them and propel their vision of the world and your whole life becomes saying no and no thank you and I need to put my head down and work. Yeah. Is that your life? That's yeah. my life. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I was just with um, my friend who's also a really great creator named Sam Sheffer. Upstairs, we were getting our, he and I have morning coffees together from time to time, and we were talking about this idea. I was bitching to him about how hard it is to find that focus. And I think that this is true for most any creative endeavors. I think it's probably even more true for maybe a writer than it is a, a filmmaker or a YouTuber. But if your job is to dig ditches, I've had that job before. If your job is to dig ditches, I've got to dig a 10 foot ditch and four feet into that, I have to stop because I scheduled a fucking podcast with Jason. Yeah. I can put the shovel down, right? do our podcast, walk back, pick that shovel right back up and I'm right where I left yeah. off. You're 40% done. 40% done. And when in the, in the world of creativity, whether you're writing or you're making videos or you're painting, it's so hard to get to that place of focus where there's no path ahead. I don't right. know that the ditch is only 10 feet deep. I don't right. even know where the ditch is. You don't even know why you're building the ditch. And I, don't, the ditch. I don't know if I need a shell. I have no idea. Yeah. So to get to the brain space, yeah. that kind of focus that the I talk flow, about, yeah. it's really incredibly um, challenging. And I say, I said a minute ago that a lot of my lack of focus is, is self-inflicted. And it, it, it really is. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I've, I've gotten better at saying no. I've gotten more comfortable with people thinking I'm, I'm maybe a jerk or an asshole because I, I refuse to take meetings or I don't even do phone calls anymore. Yeah, I never um, do phone calls. It's a disaster. Like, my, why are we on the phone? My phone um, doesn't accept incoming calls. That I have, is brilliant. I have all notifications turned off, including calls. I think that's gotten very weird for me is people will email me like six times and they're like, one person just blew up at me and they're like, I cannot believe you did not reply to my email. And I wrote back to them, I said, I, and I, it was like a moment for me to like flame them about like, are you, do you understand how many emails I get? Like, and I wrote back to them and I was like, I am truly sorry. I get 500 emails a day. I, I would need to have like literally 
you know, 150 hours a day to get through half of them and I don't. And I, I truly apologize. I'm very sorry. And then I was like, please remove them from every list we have. This person is insane. I like um, Tim Ferriss has the, it's either an auto reply or it's his, his signature and it explains why his, his response is only five words. Yeah. Because at it's, first you're like, asshole. And then you click on it and you're like, yeah, he's right. Well, people don't understand about Tim. And I think it's very interesting about celebrity. And it's what I, one of the things I want to ask you about what it's like for you. Because um, I'm good friends with Tim. People don't understand Tim's an introvert. They assume like he's extroverted because he does podcasts and he seems so engaged when he's with his guest. But we've been on vacation twice and like Tim will play basketball for an hour and then he disappears for four hours to write and think. And he, exactly like you, he needs that space, right? Are you an introvert or an extrovert? Do you know? Um, Have you taken a Myers-Briggs? I haven't, but no, I don't like to be around people. I don't yeah. go out after dark and I'm home every day. Usually bef around five o'clock is my goal, but usually it's, it's closer to 536. Yeah. Um, I, I get really, uh, this is more about me than anybody else, but last couple of years, I get really upset and offended when people ask me out for a dinner meeting or drinks. Yeah. Um, my, you want that time. Well, my emotional reaction is like, how dare you? How <laughs> dare you? Like, that is my time. Right. And it doesn't matter what the event is, what the fun thing is, or a movie premiere, or the exciting, really exciting things that I'm fortunate enough to get invited to. Right. At the end of the day, um, both literally and figuratively, at the end of the day, it's just not as great for me as sitting at home in my apartment on the carpet, like with my kids. Sure. Or yeah. just staring at the wall doing nothing. See, I think in, what introverts, the way I understand it is, after they have interacted with people, they need time to recover. They need time for themselves. Mm. And what extroverts, the definition, the best definition of extroverts, because I'm a high extrovert, is after a conversation like this, I want to take on the world. I'm like, oh my God, that discussion was so, in, you know, thrilling for me and so inspiring. Let's go have 10 more discussions. Let's go have drinks. I'm the guy who wants to stay out till five in the morning. And it's like, wait, the party's over? Really? They're like, yeah, get out. You have to go home. And, and that's the difference between introverts and extroverts. They, they take their energy from having time alone versus having time with people. Yeah. Hearing that stresses me out. Yeah. I mean, I like, um, you know, I, a big part of my income, my career is public speaking. Yeah. And I say no to a lot of, uh, engagements i say no to a lot of potential earnings because um they want to have a meet and greet afterwards or they want to have a yeah. client dinner afterwards and i'm very comfortable on a stage i feel very safe sure. even yeah. in front of thousands and thousands of people i feel very safe yeah. if you're to hook me up to an ekg my heart rate does not go up when i step in front of thousands of people i'm, I'm as calm as a cucumber right. but the minute it's over and people start to get close to me just panic panic yeah. panic panic, panic. Yeah, you're an introvert. I mean, and it's really hard because people give you, when you say no, almost universally, what people understand is you say no to a speaking gig, that is the same amount that you were making as a salary just 10 years ago. I've never made that much as a salary 10 years ago. <laughs> exactly. And it, and people are like, you you turned down a $25,000 speaking gig? I'm like, yeah, I turned it down and then they offered 50. And then I turned that down. And it sounds super obnoxious to say that because when I was coming up in this town and I was making $40,000 a year fixing laser printers, I, I would be, are you an idiot? Go do that speaking gig. But it's exhausting. You have a family and you have to say no. And what is it like to have all these people waiting outside for you? Uh, that seems really it's annoying. It's stressful. I mean, I, it's okay. I'm yeah. very public about my office address. I mean, the name of my company is 368, which is also its address. And So you hate people and then you named your company the location where you are well, most I, of the time. Not without... <laughs> Not without purpose. I do no, that I because I, I want people to associate me and my person with my my place of work. Not uh, and yeah. uh, the idea. Hopefully, is that it might keep people from pursuing me at home or uh, pursuing me elsewhere. Smart. And it's sort of work. So you know, I never get upset when people. I get upset when people have expectations. Like when somebody grabs me outside and they say to me, "Can I just have five minutes of your time?" Yeah, that's my right. response is always like, are you fucking crazy? Yeah, Five is. minutes? <laughs> like I'm literally running between meetings right now. I'm yeah. trying to shoot. I'm trying to work. I'm trying to do my, yeah. you know, I have a few hours a day to work and you want, f I don't know you. Yes. And you show up and you expect right. five minutes. Like that's a lot to ask of anyone. Yeah. Of anyone ever. I have a great system for that. I came up with about a decade ago. Somebody comes up and they say, I, I, I just need to talk to you for 15 minutes. I'm like, oh my God, I am so sorry, but I have a meeting right now. And it would be really rude for me to leave them. So maybe you can shoot me an email. If I have time, I'll get back to it. Is that okay? And they're just like, 
Yes, oh, I'm sorry. I'm the rude one. I, I just flip it on them. And it, right. It works. That seems fair. Every time I talk to a product manager at one of my investments, I ask them, how are people using the product? What's the most popular feature? How is it growing? Why are people churning? And a lot of founders and a lot of product managers don't know this basic information. Here's an easy way for you to understand how people are using your product down to the feature level, super granular. That lets you know, are you working on the right things? What if you're spending 100 developer hours this month on a feature that nobody uses, and then you don't know which feature is blowing up in your system that everybody's using? Because you are not using Segment. Segment helps you answer these questions definitively. Go to segment.com slash twist, and you will get a free Segment account worth up to $25,000. I'm not even kidding. Segment wants to capture the startup space, and they are giving listeners to This Week in Startups exclusively $25,000 in product. Go to segment.com slash twist. You can cut down on all this annoying integration by just putting a couple of lines of code in and bing, bang, boom. All of your data is in one place, and it makes it easy for you to understand all the user journeys. So this is complete. When you order their segment, when you get the startup program, Starting your conversations with what you think or what your intuition tells you or what you feel and having this back and forth for 45 wasted minutes. Start with the data. What are the users actually doing? Segment allows you to do that. Everybody is using Segment. Go ask 10 of your friends from successful startups. 10 out of 10 will be using Segment. Segment.com slash twist. Get the 25 large. This is 25 large. Go see if you qualify. I want you to go to segment.com slash twist and apply to get a segment account with $25,000. I don't know how long segment's going to do this for, but it's a great deal. Segment.com slash twist. Thanks again to the team at Segment for making a great product that so many of my portfolio companies use. And thank you for supporting our mission here at This Week in Startups to educate and inform and inspire the next generation of entrepreneurs. Okay, speaking of which, let's get back to this amazing episode. I mean, but part of what you do is celebrity-based, so you have to... Yeah, and look, the reality of it is, the truth of it is, it, it's validating. It yeah. means a lot to me. Like, right. um, you know, when, my favorite thing in the whole world is is in New York City, um, New Yorkers who don't know, don't know me, maybe know my work. Yeah. They just say, what's up, Casey? So when I'm riding my skateboard around or on my bike yeah. or whatever, they're just New like, Yorkers what's are up? cool as fuck. Yeah, yeah and it's, yeah. it's always out-of-towners that are asking for selfies or, or getting closer or anything like that. So, But all of that's validating. You know, all yeah. that for me it means that my work um, is having enough of an impact where somebody actually wants to meet me. And that's, that's a really... Uh, wonderful, flattering, self-assuring, confidence-inspiring thing. And I, um, my frustrations with it are, are tiny. Um, yeah. But what it means to me is so much more. The, the only thing that, that bothers me is, uh, and this is true for anything in life, is when I don't understand or I can't empathize with the person who's asking me yeah. or approaching me. And what I mean by that is, I get a kid standing outside 368 hoping to see me. Right. Um, flattering, I get it. If I was 15, I'd do the same thing for somebody that I admire. Sure. Uh, what I don't get is when I'm standing in Target and I've got a screaming six-month-old and a four-year-old oh. pulling at my shirt. Wow. My wife is trying to pay for groceries and a grown man comes up to me. And when I say, I'm sorry, I don't do photos and I'm with my family, he gets upset. That's bizarre. And that happens um, with enough frequency that it, I'm talking about it right now but with yeah. enough frequency that it's like it's become a, a bit of a pain point in me, my life personally and with my wife is a people's a people's lack of I saw a Twitter video this is a long time ago but of Steph Curry and he had his I think it was his daughter on his shoulders and he was walking with maybe his wife or something like that yeah. and someone asked for a selfie and he said no and the tweet that accompanied that video piece was Steph Curry wouldn't asshole his fans made him and he wouldn't take a selfie. Yeah. And I thought and I was just so so upset by that. Yeah. It's like how could you ever expect a, someone to choose a stranger over their child? Over their child. Like it makes no sense. you know, I, I don't I won't do selfies when my kids are with me, especially my older daughter. Yeah. Because I don't know the impact it would have on her when she's older, but this idea of me taking thirty seconds away from her to give it to a stranger. Um, is a lot. And yeah. if that happens every time she and I are in public, and it's not, it's 30 seconds per exchange. And if, you know, if she and I go for a walk for 20 minutes, there's 
It can be 10. Yeah. Sure. There's 10 yeah. of those. Yeah. And in aggregate, what does that do to her? And I, I don't, the answer is I, I don't know, but I'm not willing to yeah, find out. She'll be fine. I mean, you, you. I don't know that she would be. I think that that could be very damaging to a child. Instead, I'd rather offend or upset oh, or, yeah, I'm not or let to down 10 them. strangers. Yeah, yeah no. You should, than, you're doing the right thing there. I'm then just have saying, her ever question that. Having you as her dad is going to ultimately be cool. It's going to be super, it's got to be super cool because your dad is doing his best work in the world. Like, I think that's like the, when I'm a parent too, I have three kids and I just think like, if I'm doing my best work in the world and they see me working hard, I think that's what I'm supposed to do so I can set an example. Like, I work hard in the world, I, I do good, and then I come home and I'm 100% theirs, you know? It's about being present, I think. Yeah. What um, have you learned as a parent? Well... Are you still figuring it I, out like me? No, <laughs> I just, um, I hope it's okay for them. I think it's, I, I'm not as, uh, I'm, I, I wish I shared your perspective on that. I, I have much greater worries. I have friends who have parents who are big celebrities and there's a shadow there that their parents never intentionally cast, but a shadow I think oh, that's yeah. tough for them to live in. And there's a notoriety there that as a child, you never asked for, but you're being forced to cope with, um, you know, after my my first daughter, Franny, turned one. Um, we stopped putting her in any content. Hmm. No social media, no... Um, I mean, I rarely even acknowledge that she exists in my videos. Sometimes I'll share her voice. But in my youngest daughter, same thing. We don't post her anywhere. And my older son is old enough to consent. Um, and I don't mean that in such a... Yeah. I, I just mean that if he's not into making a video, he's, you know, even when we first started making videos, he, he could always just be like, dad, I don't want to do this. Right. He never did that. He always, he loves doing it. But um, I don't feel like it's okay. And I feel like it, it could be putting my kids in a position that I'm not uh, able to judge the ramifications of right now. So why take that chance? Yeah. My daughter came up to me and she said, I want to make, I said, we were talking about like what you want to do. And she said as a career, she wants to do unboxing videos on YouTube. She's nine. And this is her aspiration now. So thank you, Casey. Uh, I, I, yeah, I don't know what to say about that. Except for unboxing videos, there are something just riveting about unboxing videos. You know, the whole unboxing thing started on Engadget, the blog I started with Peter and, and Ryan and Brian. And they basically just, because Apple stuff was so beautiful, mm. they just decided, well, unboxing it is in and of itself magical. And they just took pictures. And that became the device that made, along with, doing the live keynote of Steve Jobs, rest in peace. Those were the two things that actually made Engadget go viral were the unboxing videos because people were like, this is a level of like Japanese obsession that like America hadn't experienced. You know, like you've been to Tokyo, I'm sure. Yeah. And you know that like level of obsession with everything? Like the idea that the little piece of film that comes off so needs satisfying. to be documented as you open your laptop. Well, there's also like something so satisfying about getting something new and opening it. Yes. And the minute it's opened, it's gone. Like, yeah. who cares? Okay. It's just another object. But that moment between having something that's that's sealed, it's it's Christmas morning. Like, it is. I didn't care about my presents. I cared about opening those presents. Oh my God, that is such a great insight. It's like Amazon Prime is Christmas every day because you get yeah, to- I can't remember what the hell's in that box. My house is like a UPS depot now. I mean, the, I literally have to get a room for the number of boxes coming That's to this so house. Scary. It is, it's totally scary. I had to literally, I have like such a heavy Amazon finger. I'm just like, oh my God, Anchor has something new to charge my phone. And I have like a draw full of every Anchor thing, but I'm like, well, this one is a USB-C. Did you get a um, Galaxy Fold yet? No, I saw your goofing on it and, you were uh, like, no, somebody made a viral video of you. This is getting very meta. So good. That and video, I pushed so hard. to got a million views. <laughs> it's brilliant. It's literally, you're making the most obvious observation in the world. <laughs> and it's like, it's like having two phones. And then when you fold them, it's the thickness of two phones. Yeah. I mean, what I literally say <laughs> is the like, person goes, wait, wait. <laughs> the, the, the clip, which is making fun of me, but it was so appropriate and so necessary. It was, I say when the phone is when the fold is open, it's the thickness of one fold, and when you fold, it's the thickness of one phone, and when you fold it, it's the thickness of two phones, and then it's just mind explosion. It's that um, guy. What is that meme from of the guy in the turtleneck from the seventies who goes like this? It's we had not to get from the seventies. That, that was very recent, made to look, look like, like it was something from the seventies, but that's um, 
Yeah, Tim and Eric, awesome uh, show. Good job. Thank you. Um, from Adult Swim. And it was brilliant. But no, and then there's also like, I got a lot of uh, a lot of heat for this. And it's, it's something I always struggle with because I, I do, I don't think I'm working with them right now, but I have in the past worked a lot with Samsung. Yeah, they're awesome. So anytime, I mean, look, I, I'm wearing an Apple Watch right now. I also carry an iPhone. But anytime I heat praise on something Samsung does, the whole world kind of calls bullshit. Like, yeah. I'm, like I'm being paid to say that exactly. I get it. They're right. And I just don't know how to navigate that. Like, yeah, does should. that mean I can never say anything good about their products? Maybe uh, there's an argument for that. But I think that, and I'm not talking about the Samsung phone. I'm talking about in general, folding screens are going to change everything. No, it's cool. It's definitely cool. Everything. I think like people said this about tablets and it yeah. never came to fruition. They're too big to carry with you everywhere. Yeah. Well, and I also think if you're going to carry a tablet, like fuck it, I'll just carry a laptop. Yeah, you get a full It's keyboard. better. Yeah. But all of a sudden, if you're carrying a phone, and that phone can also be a tablet. Yeah, it's game changing. And then there's an incentive to make the tablet better than a computer because you don't need to carry the... And I just like... In any event, where I'm going with this is that I have to, and I made a resolution, I'm going to do it today. I installed social media back on my Fold just for my review video. Got it. So I wanted to show people what Twitter looked like. On oh, you took the Instagram. social break? You had too much anxiety? Uh, no, I'm from done it? with social media on my mobile devices. I think it's yeah. a very healthy practice. Um, yeah. What's it been like before and after? It, Would you, you go to bed? Did you go to bed with like looking at Twitter, trending it's, topics, and then wake does. up to it? <laughs> everybody does. Yeah. Um, you do. It's so anxiety producing. My wife does. And I, look, I think we all do. And it's, it's more satisfying sitting in bed, thumbing through Instagram. Uh, what I used to do is I'd go to bed on social media, thumbing through it, and I would put my phone under my pillow. It's where I'd keep it. And I'd wake up and it'd be right there. And the minute I deleted those social media apps, that's, off of that's my, pretty degenerate, Casey. <laughs> I know. Off I of, mean, there's a nightstand you know, uh, or a draw right too, too far, under the too pillow. Too far. But the, the minute I deleted those apps, um, I didn't delete my account. I really love Twitter and I love social media. I love Instagram. But being forced to look at them on a laptop meant that I only interacted with them once or twice a day. Mm. It forced me to think, like, do I really want to share this picture? Because if I do, it's like a five step pain in the ass process, which is good. Shouldn't be that easy. Um, do I really want to thumb through Instagram right now? And I know I've got 20 emails that need to be addressed. And I know I need to be editing. Yeah. Probably not. That's Those are all good Social media kills art. Yeah, it really does. Period. When I, I deleted off my phones, and then I took a break, and I finished my book in 19 days. <laughs> Literally, I was like, oh my God, I've recaptured three hours. But it's it's one thing. Um, oh, here it is. For, here's your double phone. <laughs> for the viewers at home, um, I'm showing Jason. So here's Instagram on your phone. Like this is what it looks like. I mean, yeah. maybe this zip zip zip. Yeah. Maybe this screen's a little bit smaller, but like yeah. this is what it looks like. Okay, so you can spend a couple hours here, but then all of a sudden, Jason, when you have this, okay, for the viewers at home, for the listeners, oh, at home, I'm now flipping made... this open. Oh wow! Like, are you fucking kidding me? It's gorgeous, dude. It's dude, like that, I want it now. Wait, <laughs> how come yours isn't broken? I thought they were all broken. Did yours um, didn't break? There's they, no way. They sent you up another one. No, mine hasn't broken. There's no way anyone's tougher on their devices than I am. I think that. What was the story with that? Why Why did they all break? So know? I'm not an expert. Uh, um, Can I hold it? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm not an expert on speaking on it. Oh but, my God, your DMs are lit, kid. Yeah, I don't open There's them. There's a lot of famous people in there. Um, but even like, look at, I'm showing you my inbox right now. Look at what Gmail looks like. Or oh my God. look at it like this. Like, look how much yeah. more work you can get done. Look, you got yeah, three, you got three panes. You go back to the three columns. pane system. Yeah, it's incredible. And then even when you're writing something, look at that. Oh my god, that's beautiful. gonna be a hundred percent. Nobody's gonna have a phone that doesn't have that. I, I said that everybody ridiculed me. No, no, I, I I didn't watch your video on it. I just watched the people mocking you, and uh, <laughs> which was much more story of my life. <laughs> but it really does feel game changing. Actually, it's you can unreal. feel that with a device. Like it's to but let me see. I'm gonna put it in my yeah. back pocket here for a second. Put it in my back pocket. That's where you can tell. Oh yeah, it's acceptable. Look at there. Accept the it's trouble acceptable. is what happens when it slides out of your back pocket. You know, moving parts that piece of metal and glass has. Yeah, I mean, it's it it definitely is. To me, it feels fragile. It feels like I'm gonna break it. It feels fragile, but you could you could tell that at some point this clicking is very satisfying, that's and so they'll good. get it. This is don't buy this one that's, unless that's you have money advice. to spend. I, I, buy version three. It's always version three. They get it. I waited. I slept on the streets to buy the first ever iPhone. And I would, in 2000, was it seven, 2008? I used yeah. it for about three months before I just gave up and went back to my BlackBerry. You're like BlackBerry, and yeah. Oh, uh, no, I Nokia never thought BlackBerry. N95. Yeah, I was never like BlackBerry for life. It was just that you realize Gen 1 of anything is more of a proof of concept than, than of ever. But I haven't had the same excitement for tech. Yeah. Um, 
about anything since the iPhone came out. Since yeah. I first helped since I scroll. I remember the first time you scrolled on an iPhone yeah, and it just crazy. went and you're like, oh my Pinch God. And zoom. My Whoa. mind fucking exploded. I haven't had that feeling since the iPhone came out. Um, Have you tried and I, VR and what do you think of tried that? Tried it all. Yeah. It, this uh, a folding screen gave me that feeling. Yeah. Where you're just holding it, you're like, it's this so doesn't dope. seem possible. Yeah, um, it those, really uh, doesn't seem possible. Those I, reviews that where people flamed it are going to come back. It'll be an infamy. It'll be like people saying the iPhone was dumb. You know, but this is not dumb. I don't think people flamed it for um, the idea of a folding screen. I think what people are flaming it for was Price. the fact that um, this hardware, you know, in, in Samsung sort of by recalling it or whatever they're doing by postponing the launch, I think they're acknowledging it. This hardware is just not ready. Yeah, but it, they push the envelope. As, as a demonstration of what the technology is. I mean, think of what Apple's going to do with folding screens. It's going to be crazy. It's going to be crazy. It's They're so going to make exciting. one that folds twice. That's where it's going to get better. It's Imagine it happen. goes like this, fold, and then one more it's fold. It's going to Like the center fold in a, in a magazine so or something. So here's the dream, Jason. It's like this version one right here has a wide angle lens, a zoom lens, a regular lens, a front facing lens. Right. And then this thing right here has got a big screen on it. Imagine what that's going to be in three years. Video then combine yeah. that. I don't give a shit about video. Yeah. I'm here about making movies. Ah. Then combine that with the fact that Adobe just launched a new product called Rush, which is this cross platform editing software. Oh, is it in the browser? It's no, no, no. It's 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 native, oh. but it's you can be editing on your phone. Close your phone. Open up your tablet. Pick up right where you left off. All cloud based. Yeah. Close that. Go to your laptop and pick it up in in Premiere, and it still works. Hmm. Okay, that's like V one. But imagine like once that matures and then once this hardware matures, I'm getting to my fantasy here, which is having a small device in my pocket, which is a movie making machine wow. where I can shoot, write, edit uh, on the same level Post, of, of competency. And then interact with the Exactly. And you can you can do it. that now, but I can't, I've tried. I can't do it with the same level of precision I can on a, a desktop. It's just not possible. starting a company, two of the most annoying things you have to deal with are HR and IT, human resources and information technology. This means getting somebody on payroll, getting all their paperwork filled out, you know, that arduous thing that you do as an employee when you sign up or when you were an employee before you were a founder, and IT, getting your Slack turned on, getting all your software turned on, your login, your email, yada, yada. Well, there's a new service and we've been using it at inside.com, my startup, where we have over 40 people working and it's called Rippling. And you can go get 20% off at Rippling, R-I-P-P-L-I-N-G.com slash twist. And it is the easiest way for you to get your employees signed up and through the HR and IT process. So imagine if you hire somebody and in 90 seconds, not only do you take care of all their HR, but you also handle their computer and security, sign on and access to all the apps you use, Gmail, GitHub, Zendesk, Slack, you know, all these things. Well, you can run your business like a well-oiled machine that connects your HR and IT so you can manage your to-do lists in one place with just a few clicks. And we are loving it at inside.com. Every minute you spend updating employee data and systems is a minute that you don't spend on your core job, which is delighting your customers. Well, Rippling is delighting their customers. And it is the easiest and the most effective way for you to manage HR and IT in just one easy to use system. And I want you right now to supercharge all your employees and make onboarding easy. I know you're growing quick and you need to save time. It's never too soon to get into Rippling. Even if you're just two or three people and you're just starting out and it's the first month of your startup, perfect time to get on board. Rippling.com slash twist. R I P P L I N G dot com slash twist, and you'll get 20% off. Go ahead and visit rippling.com slash twist, and welcome to the family, Rippling. Let's get back to this amazing episode. Did you go to film school? How did um, you get into film, and how did you get so good at it? I didn't even finish high school, Jason. I know. Um, we, we, we both did our thing on um, Twitter of our first five jobs. Yeah. And I was like, dishwasher, and you're like, I was a so we, I was a dishwasher. <laughs> porter. I put porter instead of janitor because that sounded fancier. Um, and that's what my grandfather used to call it. Rest in peace, porter. Uh, no, I, 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 you know, it's like I. You grew up in New York. Grew up in southeastern Connecticut. Oh, okay. I always say the the, the poor part. 
Yeah. The shitty part. Because yeah. Connecticut's a fancy state. And when no, you go like, right oh, outside. Your dad was yeah. a banker? When you go right outside no. New York City, you get in this, the Stanfords and the Stanfords and the, um, and the Greenwich, these yeah. beautiful, very expensive towns. Hedges, hedge and then on the other hedges. side of the state, it was sort of a, where I grew up, it was kind of a lower middle class military industrial town. Yeah. I remember when Reagan left office, like all my friends' parents lost their jobs. Oh. Because we, you know, we used to build submarines right there. Right. Yeah, I could ride my bike to the second biggest submarine base in the in the country. It's right down the street from where I lived. Wow. Um, what did your parents do? I'm curious. My dad was a used when I grew up was a, a used restaurant supply salesman. Oh wow. Yeah, and my mom I had her, like uh, Ray Kroc. Not quite. Yeah. Um, I mean, Ray Kroc was great at selling. Um, Milkshake machines. Milkshake machines. Uh, no, my you know, my dad would sell dishwashers and forks and knives. And, yeah, my dad and cases had of small restaurants in Brooklyn. Like yeah, um, restaurant business is brutal. And my mom didn't really work. Yeah, and my mom. My dad now no, owns a coffee shop. Really? Yeah. So it's kind How's of your relationship with your dad? Is he like blown away by what you've accomplished? It must be mind blowing for you, him. It's mind blowing for my dad, but he, he has a hard time saying it. Um. Yeah, I don't. I. You talk to him about it? Yeah, uh, sort of. I mean, I think it was exciting for us both um, because, you know, my dad, I'm like, I remember vividly, I could probably word for word recite it, when I was 16 years old calling my dad to tell him that my girlfriend was pregnant. And to give that some context, I, um, you know, I left home when I was 15 and never went back and never took a penny from my parents, never. You were a freshman in high school. Uh, you, sophomore, yeah. Sophomore, early summer, and you... Left home. Wow. Um, and never turned back. And this is pre-cell phone. This is before, like, they couldn't contact me. They you didn't weren't know where it was. of legal age to work. I wasn't allowed to go to school because I didn't I didn't uh, have parental consent. Wow. Um, so if, if you can, and I can now empathize with him because I'm a parent, but if you put yourself in his shoes, like, you've got this kid who's always in trouble, mm. um, who then left home. Right. And you don't know where he is or what he's up to or what he's doing. And yeah. I moved, I left, I moved to Virginia. Um, my brother's in college there. Right. And you don't hear from your kid. I didn't call, I didn't, wasn't calling my parents. I was, I was angry. I, I ran yeah. away from home because I was so angry. And then you get a call from your kid and you say, he says, Hey dad, I'm, I'm having a baby. Wow. And I felt like I was an adult at age 16, but you know, now 16 yeah. year olds are, children yeah, like i have a 21 year old son and i think that he's just now really starting to become his own person and become a man and all those things his frontal lobes have not fully developed yeah. yet he's i think it's 23 or 24 when your brain is fully developed so you can make decisions yeah, yeah but at age 16 you're a kid um yeah. so in any event for my dad to see um and then i was i was probably most closest with my my dad when i was in the struggle like when i was i moved back to connecticut and i lived in a trailer park not far from him and uh you know i had to call my dad and Ask him like, how do I get a rest? How do I get a job in a restaurant? And he said, well, let me call around because he sold all these restaurants. Yeah, and that's how I got my job as a dishwasher. So my dad knew intimately that like his at the time seventeen year old kid is trying to support his family yeah. off of eight bucks an hour washing dishes at that kind of shitty restaurant that I helped him get a hours. job. It's a twelve hour shift, typically 10, 12 I would hours. Beg for the twelve hour shifts, but they're yeah. usually pretty cautious about making sure I never cross forty f- hours because yeah. they didn't want it to pay time and a half. Yeah, you got paid. Four bucks an hour, five bucks an hour, probably. I know I was getting eight bucks an eight? hour. Oh, Very right, because well you're ten years younger. You're ten years younger. <laughs> yeah, so I got to, I got to adjust it a bit. The wait staff got four an hour because they got tips. Right, but I pay them less than minimum wage yeah, because they got the tips. tips yeah. I, I never got tips. I'd get the eight bucks. Then an your hour. hands at the end of the day are just like it was like yeah, like you were swimming for ten hours. Yeah. I often talk about that because I think that when people Wrong. say like, "Where did you get your?" Um, where did I kind of find my own ambition and my own passion in my career and things like that? I always say that. If you don't, if you don't know what you want to do in life, spend as much time as you can doing something you absolutely fucking hate. Oh yeah, because yeah. spending eight hours a day, um, actually, I had two jobs because they wouldn't give me overtime, so I got another job at another restaurant. Right. So for me, it was spending eight to sixteen hours a day scrubbing pots, and like every time I picked up that steel wool, oh, and every time so like brutal. just the smell, and would have yeah. to change my apron three times a shift. It was just constantly in my brain like fuck, this is not where I want to be. This is Anywhere not where I want to be. Anywhere but here. Yeah, and it Anywhere really, that galvanizes your yeah. resolve to... Um, 100. What's the, what's the, is there's like an academic term when you go from having little means to having a lot of means? Uh, we change your station in life. You become affluent. Nope, um, nope. There's like a, there's a term for it. 
it's uh, uh, oh yeah when you move I, I, I ain't got a high school so i don't know yeah. what this i can't remember what the word yeah. is but it's it's like when you go when you transport from one place to another it's mobility mobility that's mobility, the word i was yeah. looking for like that that resolve to for mobility yeah in my life was really really set in concrete in while i was scrubbing pots for 12 hours a day as, a, as a, a day. very self-made person when you see on social media and in young people the idea that mobility is not possible in the face of you just taking it taking your career being self-motivated being self-directed what do you think do you think that it's true that people are being held back and they can't figure it out and 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 do great things in life or do you feel like i do that anybody is capable of doing anything if they have the motivation they put on the time um i don't know i don't think it's as simple as um and this is another one of those things where i've sort of my own understanding has evolved i used to be a real i think a lot of the success and the message behind my content was because of my enthusiasm for like hustle and yeah anybody can do anything and um, I, I still believe that, but I think now I'm, I'm much more focused on the nuance, which is just that like one truth, and we can pull this apart because it's a very hard thing to really comprehend what this means, but I believe that you can do, you can do whatever, you can accomplish whatever you want in life, mm. but you can't want whatever you want in life. Mm. And what that second part means is that if you if you don't really truly want it, you, there's no faking it. No. There's no half step. You, can, you and, can't manufacture motivation. And I think anybody, any of those people that are on Twitter that you're ex referring to, anywhere you experience in life that say, it's not fair, that's not true, not anyone can make it, then I think that they're right. That Because they will never make it. Mm. Because they don't want it. Right. And they may think they want it. But if they actually wanted it, they would, you know, they would probably have a mentality, the mentality that I understand, which was the, that kid scrubbing pots, which was just like, look, I may never not, uh, I may never achieve the level of success that I'm fantasizing about in the bottom of this chowder pot, but I sure as fuck will die before I give up trying. Right. And I think it's, that's, that's the want that I'm referring to when I say not everybody can get to that place. And I believe, I don't think that that's an egalitarian, I don't think everybody has the same access point. I don't think that that's fair because I just don't think everyone can access um, that mental space. I think we have, we live in a world where there's a lot of safety nets. I think that if we're all on a highway, there are exits everywhere that are so much easier than persevering. And I think that unless you truly have that kind of sociopathic resolve to achieve a level of success, um, a self-determined level of success, whatever you, whatever you set out to accomplish, unless you have that crazy gene, right. um, no, you're gonna you're gonna choose a path that's maybe a little bit less, has a little bit less resistance in front of it. And I would never fault someone for that. Uh, does that make sense? It totally makes sense. And I, I, I think the the only part that doesn't make sense to me is the insistent by insistence by a group of people that. Um, complaining about the world being unfair instead of quickly acquiring skills and taking over and building things, which is open to everybody, is a lot less work in my mind than sitting there on Twitter complaining forever. The average American is watching five hours of TV a day. And you can learn to video edit and teach yourself in, I don't know, a hundred hours, two hundred hours. What would it take to be generally good at using one of these SLRs to shoot? It took you how long? A hundred hours, two hundred hours, ten thousand. Okay, ten thousand. You want to go with the Malcolm Gladwell? By the way, you could if you got rid of TV, you would gain back eighteen hundred hours a year. So you could be relatively good at it in a couple of years. Yeah, and um, a master in five. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I just, I agree, I think. Um, I do think that the world is unfair. Of course it's I unfair, think that yes. For, for whatever reason, like a funny-looking, big-nosed Jewish kid from high school dropout yeah. from Connecticut, like, I've just been uh, hard work and all that, all that shit. But yeah. I also, like, have been tremendously lucky. 
tremendously yeah, lucky. Luck, yeah, there's always luck. I mean, luck. I'm I'm healthy. I'm not inhibited by any any health. Like the obstructions that I've faced in my career and in my life have all been overcomable. Mm. Um, so I, I think that I think that there's a there's a lot you can do to help skew luck, but mm. I think that luck is a huge component of of success and I think that it's something that's easy to gloss over especially for successful people but I'm I'm super conscious of just how lucky I've been at every single turn yeah. but you've been lucky like 15 times so at a certain point like some number of those are the massive amount of effort you're putting in and the resiliency and the hustle yeah of course of course yeah um, I, I, I would never discount anyone's effort yeah. on their way to success but I, I think that to not acknowledge um, that there are, there are aspects uh, aspects of a climb to uh, success that, that are outside of your control For that sure. are on luck and, every, and people do have different levels of struggle so as hard as it was for you with your dad being an equipment salesperson you at least had two parents present and they could sort have of, sort of. I mean, sort of, or you could have you could have had no parents. Or, look, or, I, I I always say that like I started at zero yeah. because you know I was on welfare when my kid was born. We had nothing, but I don't. I take that. I don't think that that's a fair statement. Yeah, you started at like two, <laughs> and there were I, people I, who had it rougher. No, I mean I think I started at at ten thousand. I think I started at a hundred thousand because I think that what I had to overcome as like a a kid in southeastern Connecticut who was you know on welfare and had a baby. That sounds like sh shit. It couldn't get worse than that, but then you put yourself out there. You yeah. start to understand this world a little bit. Um, I think one of the most rewarding things I've ever done in my life, and it was uh, was working with a, a nonprofit called Treat the Pain, and Treat the Pain uh, distributes uh, morphine to people who are dying of AIDS in rural Africa. So I went around and distributed these bottles of, they look like bottles of milk, but essentially it was abuse-proof morphine. Because if you drink enough to get high, you immediately vomit. Huh. So you could only take enough to really medicate your, your, your ailments. And I like, met a bunch of really interesting, wonderful people uh, on that journey through Uganda. But I remember meeting one girl. It took us six hours in a Jeep to get to her house to deliver this morphine. And she had AIDS because she was raped when she was a very young child. And she was making a, a living, making ends meet because she would sell cookies to the local people in her village. I bought some cookies. They were great. And I think that if in her life, if God willing, she gets to live to 70, 80 years old, if she were to ever get to my zero, mm. she would consider herself the luckiest girl in the world. For sure, yeah. And having the, um, having, you know, the benefit of getting to experience that, I realized like, you want to talk about luck. Yeah, like being born in America. My luck of being yeah. born in America, my yeah. luck of, you know, having parents that put food on the table, my luck of a public education system, like... Yeah. Or being born in this era. Sure, yeah. My luck of not being born in, you know, 1902 and getting shipped off to war yeah. 15 years later, my luck of not having to, you know, deal with physical ailments or being born with a, a disease or, or any of those things... That's all luck that I didn't work for. Yeah. I had that luck that I had no That's the lottery. Effort. That's the lottery. And that's why I say like, no, I didn't start. Are you fucking crazy? I didn't start at zero. Yeah. I was born with a golden ticket. Mm. You know, I was born, like I got two healthy legs and two healthy arms and I'm, I'm, I can stand tall and I can speak and I was yeah. born in America. Are you fucking crazy? You know how lucky I am? Yeah. I all mean, this other stuff is just icing. Absolutely. Uh, when you look at your art, and you think about what you've accomplished. What, what do you look forward to? In and I and I, I look at the landscape, and it's like you've carved out this incredible niche, and you've mastered it, and you you're the you're the person that everybody copies now. And do you look at cinema or TV and other forms of art and think, you know, a little bit of budget? You got this beautiful space here. Is is there something that you said if I could? Just start from scratch, and would, I, would you be a director of films? Do you have that kind of aspiration? What do you, you mean if you I so much start over, or do I, what do I want to do next? What are you asking? Yeah, me? kind of both. Like, or, so permission if you if if you had the if you had another lifetime of time, I'll phrase it this way. So if all of a sudden yet tomorrow you wake up and you could just clone yourself, and one <laughs> person could go do one project, one does the other, 
what would you have that other person do? Because you, you can keep doing this. You don't have to give up any of this. But the other person well, can do let me, let another me, 12 hours. Okay, let me answer that in a slight... Let me pretend you asked me a slightly different question. <laughs> Go for it. This is one that I've actually thought about a lot. Yeah. If I was... How old am I right now? I'm 38. 38. If I was, excuse me, 20 or 18 years younger. Yes. Meaning that, you know, when I was 20 years old, I was making videos every day in iMovie 1. Wow. On an iMac DV that had 10 gigabyte hard drive. Right. Um, think about that. 10 gig hard drive. You're trying to edit video. Wow. Um, it could handle 25 minutes of video and then I had to export to tape. Yeah. But if I was that, and I made videos every day. No zip that's drive? how much, um, no, no zip drive. But <laughs> that's how passionate I was about yeah. the act of making back then. So if I was 18 now Ooh. with all of these opportunities, I mean, I used to export to VHS tape and drive around in my busted, like, I don't know what it was, 1991 Ford Escort station wagon that had a mismatched hood that I bought from the dumpster and reinstalled in my car because my car's hood was destroyed. I drive around to people's houses, my friends, family, and I pop the VHS in their VCR and say, "Watch this movie I made." That's how I made things go viral. Wow! Was physically sh shipping. Secret net. Exactly. Um, so if I were to combine that passion with mm. the resources that are available today, yeah. I think it would be a really, really interesting trajectory. Yeah. And when I say I'm the oldest of this generation, it's because like. I'm, I am, and there are kids right now that are, I mean, one of my good friends and a YouTuber who I, I really, is, is really crushing the space is, is David Dobrik, and he's like 20, I think David's 21 or 22. He's huge. He does maybe six or eight X the viewership I do every single, every day, every month he does. He's huge, and he's a kid. Hmm. He's a kid. He bought a Ferrari last week, but he's a kid. <laughs> um so I, I often like, I don't, when I think of it in those terms, I think of like, shit, like I was born a, I was born a decade too early. No yeah. regrets, but if I was it's born a decade later. interesting you say that because when I was coming up in New York in the 90s, I was in my 20s. It was amazing here. And this digital camera came out. And I think it was like the VX1000 or something. It was some, Sony had a digital camera. I had the VX1000, yeah. Yeah. Skateboard video. Uh, and... I met this kid, uh, Darren, and he was making this movie, Pie. Yeah. Darren, Darren Aronofsky. Yeah. And then I met this other kid, uh, Bennett, and he was making this documentary called The Cruise, Bennett Miller. And now these guys have become incredible filmmakers. And they said, listen, we can now shoot on this video and we can make a movie and submit it to Sundance without ever buying film or whatever. We can just shoot. And we can shoot unlimited. There is no limit to the amount of takes, Jason. No limit. You can just keep shooting. And it was going to change film forever, and Sundance will be changed forever. And, and I guess it kind of did. And it was going to be this democratization. And it's interesting. It's not that Sundance wound up having all these amazing films. It's that YouTube eventually came out, right? And this, like, shorts kind of worked. Yeah, and look, and, and for me, that's the romance of... YouTube, and that's the romance of, of technology in the last, uh, media technology in the last 15 years is that film, moving image, I won't say film, moving image has always been the most elite art form in existence. Mm. Uh, to give that some context, if you want to be a painter, you go out for the last 10,000 years, you go get paintbrushes, yep. or you get a piece of chalk, you rub it against the rock wall. Like you've always had act, the poorest person in the world could draw something, right. could find the means to draw something. If you wanted to sing, you could sing. If you wanted to write, you need a pen and paper. Yeah. Um, but if you wanted to make a moving image, if you wanted to make a movie, yeah. I mean, you needed celluloid, you needed cameras, you needed crews, you needed Lights. education, understanding all of those things. And what we've seen in the last 15 years is this, this democratization of that elite medium. Mm. Yeah. To the point of, of I, I think, like especially in the Western world, like a total egalitarianization of that process, where now whether you use it or not, every person has a device on them at all times that can shoot ultra high quality video, that they could also use that very same device to edit, and yeah. then they can use that same device to distribute it to everyone on planet Earth. It's bonkers. And that I mean, I say that it's a little bit of a hyperbolic statement, but it's not that far off. No, I, it's. If you were to count the fact that even if you don't own a mobile phone, you are within feet of somebody who does. Sure. So it, it can reach everybody. Right. And China may have 
you know, YouTube blocked, but there are VPNs and there's, you know, absolutely. Um, so yeah. I, I, it's, it's not that far of a stretch to say you can distribute it to the entire world. Yeah. And I think like the profundity of that is something that if you were to go back and explain it to Darren Aronofsky in 1996, yeah, no, they were his still head trying might to explode, <laughs> but, but that's the reality of the world we live in right now. And I, I think it's a much more beautiful, romantic thing to be a part of, of it now yeah. than I think what it would have meant to me when I was a 15 year old fantasizing about someday being in Sundance. Yeah. For me, I'm now I'm part of something that we can all be a part of versus back then when it was this elitist yeah. um, kind of exclusionary uh, medium. Uh, it was very interesting. He said, uh, I'm, I'm doing this film. Would you, with your magazine, Silicon Eye Reporter, do a screening? And I was like, what is that going to cost? And he's like, I don't know. And I was like, okay. So I went to the theater and had my assistant go and we, we paid them a thousand dollars, and then I bought everybody drinks after. It's like Jason, I can't believe you did this for me. Thank you so much. I, I, nobody was really had seen pie, and their marketing plan was they went around New York with a cardboard box, and they had a stencil in the bottom of the box of the pie symbol, and they would put it on every street corner, the weekend it came out, and they spray painted in the box so they wouldn't get caught by the cops. Then they would go to the next corner, and they just put the pie symbol That's on so every weird. corner everywhere. I've never heard that and story. And everybody in New York was like, why are there pie symbols anywhere? And then in the back of the Village Voice was a little tiny ad for, with the pie symbol opening. It was so, crazy. Such a good movie. You should go see pie if you haven't seen it. Yeah, it's crazy. What, um, who's your inspiration Like when you think about film? Are you a Kurosawa guy? Are you a... Paul Thomas Anderson, what do you like? What's your I favorite really film? I love Paul Thomas Anderson. Um, I love The Master. My, you ever see this movie, The The Master? I've not seen The Master. I'll go see The Master. I'll go see The Master. My favorite movie Ooh. of all time yeah. is a movie called The Life and Death of Colonel Blimp. And it was made 1943, British movie. Wow. And um, it's, it's Wes Anderson has taken a lot from this movie. Um, as far as the cinematography and the style and yeah. the, sort of the quirkiness of it. Like the opening title sequence is not uh, titles on screen like every movie ever made. It's literally a gigantic uh, tapestry. And they had embroidered all the names of the people involved in the movie into the tapestry. And the camera just sort of punches in and pulls back out and punches in and pulls back out. Wow. Which is so... You know, like I, I do that now. I ra I'd always rather write something on a piece of paper and show it to the lens yeah. than ha just have an optical title pop up. But the reason why it's my favorite movie is that it captures everything I love about storytelling and filmmaking. Mm -hmm. So the movie itself is about a salty old um, military officer and how his thinking is no longer relevant in World War II. Huh. And to show you his process, they go all the way back to when he was a very young man fighting in the Boer War and wow. you know World War One, And so it spans time, a lot of time, like 70 years told in an hour and a half. And that's the story. So it's this beautiful, romantic, incredible story. But then the production itself is really what sells it, what takes it to a whole other level for me. So 1943 in Britain, this is when they're getting the shit being bombed out of them by Hitler. Yeah. This is during the peak of the Blitz. This is during when no one had any food and it was, you would, there were such restrictions on what resources you could use. And, at that time, they decided to make a movie, and not just a movie, but a movie about the military. And they shot it in London at the peak of the war. And those limitations are what made it great. Yeah. Like there's one exterior shot of, of the, the hero of the movie having a duel, you know, like a, of a sword fight for satisfaction. Yeah. It's amazing. It's part of the story. And they're doing it in like this old barn. And it's happening at night. And they needed an exterior shot of the barn at night. Um, but you couldn't have lights on at night then. Yeah. You could be so like, they, Blow literally, this up. <laughs> they literally just painted. They did a big painting of a barn at night and they cut holes where the windows would be and they lit lights behind them and they'd have a moving shot, but the shots of a painting. Brilliant. And I always think that like Embrace Your Limitations has been sort of one of my, the charter of my filmmaking style. Like don't think of limit limitations as obstructions, but think of them as opportunities. Yeah. And that movie encapsulates that idea on such a level. Um, for so many reasons, yeah. so that's my that's my favorite movie. Yeah, no, great. It's great it's movie. like limited resources makes great art for sure. Like sometimes you have like too much paint and too big, too many canvases. It's like you don't value the canvas all that much. You, yeah, or like you've got a you know like a, a Michael Bay kind of movie. No, oh no heat to Michael Bay, but like you take. You, you I got, can't watch that movie. It's just like it's an assault. I I can't keep up with the frames when the when the transformers are moving sure, different things. I'm like. I, can you slow this down? How many frames per second is it? I, it's a giant blur to me. 
I just remember I saw, or like Transformers 2 or yeah. whatever, on the same weekend that I saw that Mike Tyson documentary where it's just Mike Tyson sitting talking to camera. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm, very, I'm a, very simple when I, when I judge a movie. Yeah. I either liked it or I didn't. Like it was either I was engaged or I wasn't. Yeah, that film is incredible. And I've seen it, the documentary, yeah. It, right, and, and I'm like, okay, well, just this one man talking to camera had me riveted for two hours. And two hundred million dollars worth of the most technologically advanced special effects, like had me dozing off. I, I just wanted to get out of the room. I was just like, "This is just offensive right, to my but, senses." <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just I'm bringing it to where you started, where you yeah. said that like re- limiting your resources can benefit the artistic process, and mm-hmm. I think that that's extremely true in the world of media. As we wrap up, and, and I know that like talking for two hours, and I've taken all this time. How from much you. have long we've been talking? We've been talking for an hour. Um, we're we're only it's only sixty minutes. Don't worry. Uh, uh, did we did get to any of your questions? No, zero. Great. But it was Sorry a, it was a incredibly compelling discussion. I my secret to doing interviews is I have notes. I read them, but I just listen as intently as I can to the person, and then I think which of the things they just said would be the next logical jumping off point to go deeper and unpack. Does that make sense? Yeah, but do you think we got deep? I think we probably covered stuff that you've never covered, or maybe, I don't know. Where would you put this in your, have you ever been interviewed by people for an hour? Have yeah, you, yeah, I think so. Yeah, well, where would you put this in the pantheon of Casey interviews? Um, Top I'd, three? I, I would put it in there. Yeah, if it's in the pantheon, I'm it's good. It's in the pantheon. <laughs> well, well, the audience will know. What the heck's going on in this space? I came in here and it's like a big empty box and then some a beautiful Samsung TV. Sure. I mean, so Samsung makes great TVs. T- to paint a picture, we're yeah. in um, my kind of media company in downtown Manhattan right now. And the name of this company is 368. And we're on the second floor, which is sort of like the, the basement. And um, the kind of thesis, the premise of this whole company is to be a, kind of a beacon or a lighthouse for the, the creator community, the yeah. creativity focused creator community. Um, so most of the time, it's like it is now, which is very quiet and empty. Yep. Um, but when it's not quite an empty, it comes alive in a way that's like total madness and chaos. And we usually have somewhere between like three to six or three to seven kind of events or engagements a week. Wow. Um, and when we do that, it's anywhere from, you know, 80 to I think 170 people is as many people as we can let in. Mm. Um, this past weekend we did like the, you know, moment lenses, the startup that makes really fancy lenses for your iPhone and for your, your Samsung phones. They had a film festival here this past weekend. It was totally packed. It was a madhouse. Um, we do gaming events. We have one, I think mortal Kombat. who Patrick, when's the mortal Kombat event that happened. Yeah. It already happened. Yeah, you have like a, about a dozen rigs down here. <laughs> we, have a, we, have a, we have a huge sort of gaming studio. Are you a gamer? You play a lot of games? I don't. No, no, no. But we have a huge, it's a big part of the community. So yeah. we have a huge sort of gaming uh, setup, gaming studio here. And we don't have our own team, which is a, a wonderful thing. So that means we can work with sort of all kinds of gamers and streamers from yeah. across the board. It's a non-competitive. Um, yeah. we, we take a non-competitive stance. So it means that we can do competitions in here. We have people wow. from all parts. And then... Um, and then the upstairs, which is a big kind of 6,000 square foot, 16 foot ceiling open space is super dynamic. And like for the film festival, it looked like a movie theater upstairs. Right. And um, we do, we have big gaming events. We'll turn upstairs into like five living rooms where in addition to the studio, gaming studio down here, we have got big gaming events upstairs. But essentially we wanted to be a resource for creators. Mm. And the events we do enable that and they enable sort of a coming together of what is an otherwise fragmented community. Mm. Um, And uh, the business that we built behind that is by elevating uh, the talents of creators to a point where they can make money. Mm. And what that literally means to not be so wishy-washy or whimsical about it is that I think in the creator community, there's this misunderstanding that the only way you can make dollars and cents is by building your YouTube audience big enough so you can exploit it by selling them sweatshirts or AdSense or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think there's a higher uh, value on creativity that goes way above view counts. Yeah. And that's kind of, you know, opportunities like connecting creators with brands that are looking to do things. And yeah. we do a lot of work with brands in here. Um, we're wrapping up another Adobe campaign right now. It's being directed by two creators, being edited by another creator. 
um, we, you know, we work with great companies like GoPro and Red Bull and yeah. uh, Electronic Arts. And for every one of those engagements, we are reaching out to creators that we like or know. And we don't care how big their audience is. We don't care how big their reach is. We only care about one thing, which is their, their creativity and what they make. So we bring jobs to creators and um, we produce those jobs. There's a business in that. And it's a very symbiotic relationship between what we're doing both um, as, you know, to help elevate the community and then what we're doing kind of in the industry to connect the industry with these creators. And via that symbiosis, there is a a real business that has been, you know, we're nine months old, but we're profitable and we've got pretty solid cash flow positive in here and we're slowly scaling. Yeah, people want to go somewhere and meet with people and, and make this real, right? Like I, I saw videos of that VidCon thing and like there's a thousand like people chasing, who are those dipshit kids with the, who- Are like, talking what? about Jake and Logan Paul? Yeah. yeah. I, I, I don't know if you think they're dipshits, but I mean, they seem like idiots. Um, I mean, they're making fun of people committing suicide and like, they, they just really seem like the worst of humanity um, to me. They've definitely- uh, done some rather egregious offenses in the world of social media. But no, I saw they were doing like some kind of like race baiting white versus black guys boxing kind of thing. And I just thought that was kind of lame. Yeah, I'd rather not use any more time of our yeah. precious Ugh, time to talk what about. What do you think about YouTube um, and how they have worked with creators? Because there was this horrific moment where somebody who was deplatformed, who obviously or was most likely suffering from some mental illness as well, went to the YouTube campus and shot people on the campus because she had been deplatformed or demonetized, I guess. She, our videos were allowed up. The monetization was taken off. I quit YouTube. We had a, we were one of those like paid partnerships at one point for one of my companies, and I was like, this is ridiculous. They keep changing the rules. They're taking 45% of the money. I'm out. It's, you can't make this work. It's, it's too hard to deal with a company that won't even talk to you about the changes they're making. You've seemed to have ridden that out pretty well. What do you think of how they've treated the creators? And how, what's your relationship like with them? Because you have built that platform. We've been on one of the major, one of the top 10 most important people in the history of the platform. How did they treat you? How did they look at you? And how do you look at them? Well, that's a lot to unpack. But I, I, I have a unique relationship with them because I have a personal relationship with mm-hmm. them. And when I say them, I mean, you know, a, a lot of people within the company yeah. that I personally know and that are truly wonderful people. Yeah. So I don't think it's fair to compare my relationship with the relationship broadly of the community because I think it's it's I'm 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 privileged and I acknowledge that. Sure. Um, yeah. But um, one thing I will say that uh, I think maybe is a little unexpected, especially to my peers in the community, is that I'm I'm kind of quick to defend what an impossible impossible task it is for YouTube to build a place where, you know, they've got what 2 billion active monthly active users and say if 10 million of those are creators, how in the world do you with a thousand or a hundred thousand employees, how do you possibly build an environment where you are making money? Cause that's your business. That's what you're supposed to do. And you're also keeping all of these yeah. creators happy. So I think that, look, they've definitely had missteps and I've yeah. made a lot of videos that call them out for those yeah. missteps. I'm not exactly shy about that, but I I do feel for them. Like I, yeah. I get it. Um, you know, I read a scary Bloomberg article about how they, um, they weren't reactive enough or maybe they prioritized that Bloomberg article a couple of weeks ago where they pri- it stated that they prioritized um, growth over maybe keeping the platform safe, safe from yeah. uh, from just like Facebook and Twitter they they all are at the altar of engagement yeah and they train the algorithm to extend the length of a visit sure and and I, I only bring that up to say that like I, I, I would know I would never sort of excuse the shortcomings and the missteps that they've made yeah. I would never defend that yeah. but I, I I would stop short of vilifying the platform and everything they do yeah. the same way that I think there's a lot of a lot of people are really offended about some of the censorship on Twitter and a lot of people are really offended about the um, the way in which you know Instagram is so uh, aggressively monetized and the algorithm there is so specific to how, uh, how long it can maximize engagement I would never excuse any of that because yeah. I think that these companies are doing 
um, are making decisions that maybe not are in the interests, uh, the best interests of the world, but are instead in the best interests of their bottom line. Yeah, they're they're not humanity positive decision making machines. They're money making, engagement extending machines, and that's the lesson I think they need to sort of take to heart now that the platforms have been become so big. I mean, we've never had these in the scale of humanity. That was kind of your point about how wonderful this is, and it's a giant experiment. Like, what happens if everybody is going to bed with their phone and then waking up to the trends of what is the worst thing that happened today? Right, and I, I think, that, look, the vilification's easy. Yeah. We could sit here and, and mm. shit on all social media platforms all day, but I, I, am, I am the product of the good parts yeah. the, of that. I think that I, I do really romanticize this, the idea of Twitter. Right. Of connecting everyone in the world, right? And I see the the negative sides of it. it's real, yeah. but I see the positive sides, and I think that it's very easy to be hypercritical yeah. of YouTube, especially for some of their shortcomings in their community and how they've treated the community and all of that. But look what they've look what they've done or enabled so many people to do. Or you know, uh, back when you first met Darren Aronofsky in the '90s, how many people aspired to be Filmmakers are share how many people aspired to share perspectives and ideas via moving images, right. and how many people do that now? And that's the product of entities like YouTube and yeah. Instagram, and and so I'm uh, I'm uh, I have a very conflicted perspective on it because I so appreciate what social media enables, and I'm equally fucking terrified about the aspects of it that we have yet to really understand. Yeah, it's pretty scary. I just thought that was such a boneheaded decision. I was like, okay, wait a second. You're going to demonetize the people with the least views who make the least amount of money. In other words, the people who need the money the most, you're going to cut them off. The, the up and comers, right? Because they said like anything under 10,000 views would not be able to monetize or whatever. Sure, okay. So and let I was me, like, oh my God, like what do you think will happen? You just, you just me, pulled up the ladder. Let me play... Devil's advocate, because nothing nothing you just said is wrong. Right. And again, I'm not I'm not taking a position here. I'm not defending YouTube. Sure. But if I was the CEO of YouTube, I think that my response to that would be would be something like this, which is, if everyone can monetize every video, and I don't know the specifics. I think it's maybe you have to have a thousand subscribers before something you can monetize. Um, that would mean it'd be very very easy for uh, a a troll farm to be making thousands of accounts a day, stealing videos and posting them. Mm -hmm. and monetizing their initial views before the either the algorithm or the humans behind it are able to catch these accounts and shut them down. Right. So by raising the bar to 1,000 or 10,000, whatever the, whatever the number was, it would prevent yeah. that kind of gross abuse of the monetization platform. And that it was that gross abuse of the platform that led to the, in part, led to a lot of the advertisers pulling back their funding because they don't want to be in front of stolen footage or garbage footage. Or you know what it's like? Or... It's like, it, it's a valid argument. And I, I don't it's know. It's like changing I'm... the weather. Like if you start screwing with nature and yeah, changing the, the weather, it's like, what the fallout's gonna be. it's like, yeah, we're going to make it sunny here in Portland. It's like, okay, great. Because now you just turned you know, uh, Missouri into a desert, like what, whatever. Right, it's the butterfly effect. It's so the I, butterfly effect. I, um, again, I say that because I'm not, I, not to defend any decision, but I say that because I think that they're in a, in a wildly uncharted territory. Yeah. And I think, I, because I know they're, they're good people. And, and they're even, good people. They make, yeah. Even if their decisions aren't always perfect, I think that they're, they're trying to accomplish something that's very, very hard to do. So I, I'm a creator and I empathize first with creators, but I, I think I sort of uniquely also, uh, when I ask myself, what would I do in their position? And I can't come up with an answer. I, I told you this before, but I think you should just go, and I would totally back you for this. You should just create your own platform and invite, based on your taste, the hundred creators you want to have on the platform create a parallel universe. You don't have to give up that one. And then let those hundred create the next, invite the next hundred, right? Some sort of, cure, you know, the skimming of the cream of that group, leaving behind those dipshit kids who act like idiots and are offensive and just cherry pick the best ones and the, kind of build a new world because everything dies, everything goes away. That is the nature of our existence. And it will have its era, YouTube, and then something will come, but you're the person to make that or you and the two or three are top of the creators like, for the love of God, create a competitor. Let me give you a million dollars. Like we it could, is, we could call it vessel. 
Mm, that was, the mistake on that one was they were trying to get people to pay, right? And that just I just think creates. I think I said this in some very long winded DM, but yeah, we're DMing. It we're is, sliding into each other's it's, DMs. It's a it's a part of the reason why it is what it is is because it is such a huge monolithic monster. Yeah, and discovery is a huge part of their success. And when you start to remove those things. Mm you start to de-incentivize creators. And I yeah. think that sure creators want to make money and some are out there for fame and less than perfect reasons. But I, I, the validation that is a viewership drives, uh, you know, drives me, it drives a lot. Everybody wants to be validated. So yeah. when you're, something comes with that it, momentum, I think, I, I, look, something will come after it. it yeah. There will be something that makes sense. I think that Netflix is a real sort of competitor to something like that. Amazon talked years ago about enabling content creators to upload their own yeah. stuff and they sort of pulled back from that. I do. I got look, pinged by them too. They were like, yeah, what's going on with these video shows? I, like, I, I just think that Google Plus can never compete with Facebook it's just another Facebook and yeah. I think that um, no, it has to have some I, I original idea. Another, yeah. I think that there's something will come out that will give creators a viable option to what is existing right now, but I don't think it'll look like what exists right now. I think Twitch is an interesting example of offering a sort of something that that's not an exact copy of YouTube that people have really sunk their teeth into. I think that Snapchat's explosion was because it was the anti Facebook, and yeah. I think that um, I think that mediums will always evolve and always change and. Uh, YouTube is is certainly not is certainly susceptible to that. Yeah. But I'll tell you right now, and I'll make this clear as day. I can say without any equivocation that that initiative will not be led by Casey Neistat. <laughs> You're like, I do not want to build a <laughs> billion. Is, I want to do horse art. I don't want to ride. All right, listen, Casey. I could I could talk to you for hours, and I did. Uh, thanks for taking the time. I know you're busy. Hour and uh, Twenty minutes, Jason, you're killing me. I I didn't even know it went that far. They just kept showing me the things. I was like, oh, at least we are talking. I I I feel like we just scratched the surface. Hey, continued success. I love what you do, and it's. I mean, it's great. I, we were talking before. I don't know if we ever actually met in person, but we talk on like the internet, and it creates this weird, like yeah, you're familiarity. In, it's you're weird. In this, you're in this the the tertiary level of friendships that are um, the social media friends. It. I do feel like we're friends, and because we've had conversations that were like kind of meaningful. Uh, I think meaningful. I don't know. Who knows? Um, but continued success. I respect what you do, and. Um, yeah, congrats on the space, too. I think it's really interesting. Appreciate it. There was something called Pseudo.com on 600 Broadway. A guy named Josh Harris. Did you ever hear of that? I don't think that sounds like before. The, in Web 1.0, he basically got a space like this. He had a bunch of people playing Doom, awesome. a bunch of models, drugs, and internet people in Web 1.0, and it was insane. Yeah, we don't have any models or drugs, but we have some Diet Red Bull and a bunch of... Uh, and a bunch of video games. And a bunch of... Do you have Doom? Cool kids. Nope, but we... Did have... you ever see We Live in Public, the documentary about it? I have seen that. Yeah, that's the guy, Josh Harris. Okay. Which I'm in that documentary because I was a reporter at the time covering him. Amazing. Josh Harris, watch it. We Live in Public. All right, Casey, we'll see you all next time on This Week in Startups. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.